We are live and in high definition from San Juan, Puerto Rico, where a packed house awaits the entrance of local hero, welterweight champion Miguel Cotto. It's the first defense of his 147 pound title, and Cotto will look to impress in front of a raucous crowd of diehard fans. Cotto's opponent, Uktai Urkal, a long trip from Berlin, Germany, will have his hands full tonight trying to topple the young champion with hardly a supporter in the house. Very quickly, let's we bring you back to San Juan with a look at old San Juan. Let's take care of a piece of boxing business this past weekend. There was quite a flurry of information in the sport, rumors spurred by an article in a London newspaper that suggested that former heavyweight champion Lennox Lewis was indeed in training and planning a comeback to the ring, possibly for a fight against the likewise comebacking Vitaly Klitschko. Lennox, uh, what's your basic response to the report that you're coming back? Well, I'm not coming back. It's all flattery. I'm very happy being a family man, a commentator. Uh, as you can see, I'm putting on a little weight, and you've never seen a skinny king, so I feel good. So you've answered the question for now. Are you answering it for all time? Yes. Uh, Lennox Lewis is not coming back. I think your legacy remains intact as one of only two men in the history of the heavyweight division to have defeated every man with whom you were ever in the ring, the other being Rocky Marciano. That's something greatly to be proud of. Thank you. Well, if you've... Uh, paid attention to Puerto Rican boxing and Puerto Rican athletics over the years and is as as is marked by the fact that we have boxing tonight in an arena that's named for a legendary baseball player Puerto Rican athletes tend to stick together recently we had a chance to observe young Miguel Cotto on the golf course with another Puerto Rican legend Chi Chi Rodriguez let's take a look welcome to Puerto Rico I'm going to play uh, some goals today with uh, one of the greatest players of, of the whole time, Juan Rodriguez. You, you know him better as Chichi Rodriguez. Oh, Miguel, ¿cómo está? Me alegro verte. <laughs> You're strong. Are you training? A little bit. Jesus Christ, you hit that like you like you were going to hit Mayweather. Shane Mosley, he won't go four rounds against you. I saw him fight the other night. Miguel Cotto and Chichi Rodriguez. Puerto Rican athletes from different generations <laughs> who seem polar opposites. Chichi golfs clown prince with the matador dance. Cotto, the coldly intimidating fighter with the paralyzing left hook. But together, they form quite the duo. I never seen him play this good. On the trap. On the trap. Chichi, it's an honor for me to be uh, Chichi's friend. He's a nice guy. He always uh, tried to be uh, funny. This is an exploding golf ball. Miguel Cotto doesn't know it. I'm going to even tee up your ball. How is this? So you can get a good lie. He's going to hit it probably as hard as he hit all those fighters with his left hand. When he hits it, he's going to blow up. Let it fly, baby. God almighty, you hit it so hard, you made it explode. <laughs> I love to play with him, you know? And when I hit the ball and the ball explode, uh, I just laugh. I know Chichi uh, pretty good. I know he, he has uh, a, a, every, every trick make you happy. I don't change Chichi for anyone. Miguel is the kind of guy that goes in the ring and he'll want to knock you out, but if he knocks you out and it's someday you need some money, He'll give you not only the money, he'll give you the belt if he has to give it to you. And that's why I like him. All right, all right. You hit that ball like a pro that time, you yeah? You want to be my, my caddy? Yeah, I'll be your caddy. Despite a 45-year age difference, Miguel and Chichi have developed a friendship beyond the ring and the links. I used to be a golfing star. I'm not a star anymore. I have passed the baton. The baton belongs to, to Miguel now. Chichi has been like a mentor for me. He, he teach me things about life, about sports, about the people. You got Carlos Beltran and uh, Ivan Rodriguez and Carlos Delgado, a lot of them, but you're the only fighter right now, so you need to carry that on your shoulders. I love him like a son, you know. Uh, uh, what I don't want him to do is get hurt. When Miguel is fighting, I get nervous. He had a fight in Atlantic City. I almost threw the handkerchief in because I didn't have a towel, man. 
He gets ripped again, and down goes Miguel Cotto. And then when he came back up, man, he was awesome. And I said, that's the sign of a, of, a, of a great athlete. He has to get up from the bottom and come back and knock the guy out, and he did it. Miguel Cotto survives a life-and-death challenge from Ricardo Torres. Esto lo hice en el, en el Master del 78. <laughs> yeah, that's what I like of him. He misses a shot and he laughs. You had enough club there. You had too much Miguel Cotto. You want to play one more hole? Yeah. Okay. Let's play the last hole. I'm going to beat you. At day's end, a boxing superstar and a golfing legend shared one more moment, a passing of the torch of one of the most memorable celebratory signatures in sports. Watch this, Miguel. You want to wait? Let me show you, because you can break your thumb. No, no, no. First of all, you do it here, because that way you have control. Then you have to put the thumb here, and the thumb here. In. Out. And I kill you. Kill the German, don't kill me. <laughs> Chi-Chi's reference to kill the German is to opponent Oktai Urkal tonight, and Miguel's not actually going to try to kill him, just to knock him out. Larry Merchant, we've been talking for years about Miguel Cotto's great potential, and in the eyes of many, he's begun to fulfill that potential now, particularly since moving to the welterweight division. Yet in six years as a professional, he still has yet to fight a real super top flight fighter. What do we make of that? After he showed world-class resilience following th that knockdown, he was put on the slow track. It was dr dramatic for us, but traumatic for his handlers. So since then, he has faced only punchless boxers, like the one he's facing tonight in Urkal. We know the result. Cotto is a 20 to 1 favorite. The good news is that his relentlessly aggressive style, at least against this type of fighter, is its own reward. Yeah, that's what fans are uh, here to look for, is to watch Miguel Cotto break Urkel down to the body. And uh, Lennox, of course, Oktai Urkel comes from one of those European backgrounds. We often see guys like this who don't have a lot of punching power but have athletic skill. At his best, five years ago, he fought a really great fighter, Costa Zoo, to a near standstill. So how does he now approach a whirlwind like Cotto on Cotto's home turf? It's going to be difficult. Uh, he's in great shape. What you can do is try and get Cotto out of his game. Try and make him make mistakes and take advantage of him. You know, Cotto's coming here pretty confident. He's in front of a home uh, town, so he's going to make mistakes. He's going to get a little desperate, so you wait for him. Definitely don't get hit and move around. Let's That's the most he can do. The first movement that Urkal will make will be, of course, his walk to the ring. And uh, you're talking about a young man whose parents came from Izmir, Turkey, uh, he was born in Berlin, Germany, at a moment when his parents were on a uh, three-week vacation to, uh, to Berlin. And uh, we're going to take a look at the tail of the tape for Miguel Cotto against Oktai Urkal. Urkal spent 21 years fighting at 140 pounds. He won the Olympic gold medal in Atlanta in 1996 in the 139-pound weight class and then stayed a professional at 140 for a long, long time before finally moving up to welterweight just in his last few fights. Cotto, of course, has only fought one fight at welterweight, breaking down Carlos Quintana five months ago. A half-inch height advantage for Urkal, an arm length advantage of an inch and a half measured from the armpit to the end of the fist for Cotto. They weighed in within a pound of the 147-pound limit, and tonight Miguel has gone up to 159, where he'll outweigh Urkal unofficially by nine pounds. Rules are the bout with our unofficial ringside scorer, Harold Letterman. The Miguel Cotto Octe Urkel fight is scheduled for 12 rounds using the unified rules of the Association of Boxing Commissions. There is no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight. In case the cut is caused by an accidental headbutt, we go to the scorecards if the four rounds have been completed and you cannot be saved by the bell at any round, including the 12th and final round. And we got open scoring. At the end of rounds four and at the end of round eight, the Puerto Rican Boxing Commission will announce the scores of the three official judges. So, Jim, it's going to be very interesting. No, Harold, it's not. And please don't sound excited about open scoring. It is an idea that does nothing to enhance the drama of vice. It only limits it. 
And here comes Arkal running to the ring, Lennox. Yeah, he's showing he's in good shape. Like he's ready for the fight. He's an underdog running to the ring. I can remember seeing Buster Douglas run to the ring when he fought Mike Tyson. Erktow said one of the most honest things I've heard, ever heard a fighter say to us yesterday. When we ask him what he would do, he says, you can only fight as good as your opponent lets you. Most fighters only want to admit that they had a bad night, not that the opponent made them have a bad night. He has mentioned retirement, Lennox. Larry always says when a fighter talks about retirement, he's retired. Your take. I believe when a guy f talks about retirement, he's almost retired. He's just sticking around basically for the money. He has nothing else to do. $375,000 to make the trip from Berlin here to Puerto Rico to be matched as the foil for Miguel Cotto tonight. And as we mentioned, Cotto has elected to walk to the ring without music. So this is a celebration of him here in Puerto Rico. Lennox Lewis made the point in the on-camera, Larry, that Cotto might make mistakes in front of a home crowd. He got rocked by uh, Demarcus Corley here in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and had trouble in that fight. Some thought that maybe his concentration was flawed on that night. It's a natural thing. Whether Urkal can exploit it is questionable. You know, we, have, uh, we and others have touted him as the successor the heir apparent to uh, Tito Trinidad. But, but let's be real here. Tito Trinidad, at this same age of 26, already had defended titles 15 times, had beaten Whitaker and De La Hoya, was a kind of boy wonder with a photogenic smile, and the people here loved him. That's a hard one to live up to. And that's why two years after his shutout loss to Winky Wright, a lot of people still ask if Tito Trinidad's coming back. Let's go to Michael Buffer now for the official introductions. Damas y caballeros, Bob Aramie, top rank boxing presentan Doce Asaltos por el titular Welter del Mundo, 12 rounds of boxing for the WBA. Welterweight Championship of the world. Sanctioned by El Comision de Boxeo de Puerto Rico, Chairman Jose Peña Garicano. Honorable Alcalde de San Juan, Jorge Santini in attendance at ringside. WBA Supervisor, Jose Oliver Gomez. At ringside, the three judges scoring this contest, Los Tres Jueces Son, Gustavo Estrella, Kijutra, Nelson Vasquez, and inside the ring, working for the 64th time in a world title belt, El Referee Luis Pabon. And now, ladies and gentlemen, y ahora, damas y caballeros, ahora, borricuas, desde San Juan, Puerto Rico, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Fighting out of the blue corner, wearing black, official weight, 146 pounds. Professional record, 38 victories, including 11 by knockout, with three defeats from Berlin, Germany, the WBA mandatory welterweight world challenger, Oktay Urka. Fighting out of the red corner, wearing red and white, official weight, 147 pounds. A perfect professional record, 28 bouts, 28 victories, including 23 knockouts. The reigning, defending, WBA welterweight champion of the world, El Invicto de Jaguas, Puerto Rico, Miguel. Only one, only one. Okay, vamos abajo, vamos. Mucha gente, vamos. 
Toto. Vamos abajo, tú con... Viene con él, viene. Vamos abajo, vamos, vamos. Ok, muchachos, yo le di las instrucciones en el camerino. Vamos a hacer una pelea limpia. Que gane el mejor, ok? Suerte. You've often heard the expression in boxing about an underdog that he has a puncher's chance. The question tonight about Urkel is, does he have a boxer's chance? Last year, an Italian fighter named Gianluca Bronco was cast in Urkel's role and got busted up like never before in a 42-fight career. Body punchers hurt you in ways that head punchers sometimes do not. And Miguel Cotto is regarded now by some as the supremo body puncher in the sport. At five feet, eight inches tall in a division where there are fighters who are six feet one or six two like Paul Williams, 5'11 like Kermit Cintron, 5'10 like Antonio Margarito, he's going to have to be a continuously effective body puncher. Miguel starts out jabbing to Urkel's head. up the middle by Cotto lands on Urkel's face and two of Urkel's losses against Vivian Harris he was bedeviled by a broken nose 12 round close decision loss to Harris and then 11th round TKO in both of those fights his broken nose hampered him in the late rounds Cotto doesn't go so much for the nose as he goes for the rib cage most particularly his best punch is the left hook to the liver that's the punch that knocked out Carlos Quintana if you saw Urkel walking down the street with that nose, you would say there's a fighter. 100%. Cotto reaching for the first time to try to get that left hook to the body in. And already you see the professionalism of Oktay Urkel. Doesn't back off. Knows how to move just the way Miguel Cotto moves. And aggresses with the jab in the right hand himself, trying to make an impression here in the first round. And if you notice, he's, he definitely knows about Koto's body punching because every time Koto goes to the body, or even if he doesn't go to the body, Urkel puts his elbows down. He's protecting his body. He knows that Koto's a body puncher. Well, by the time Bronco left the fight against Koto last year in the eighth round, his right arm was out of the socket from the number of times that Koto had hit it with his left hook. So that's the kind of thudding damage that Miguel can do with that punch even if you're guarding against it. Urkel's got an extensive amateur career, so he's, he's well schooled. Won a gold medal at the Olympics in 1996. Uh, I think there's a correction there, Jim. I think he won the silver. Well, he beat an American named David Diaz uh, en route to yeah. the medal. <laughs> he was a teammate of the Klitschko's as an amateur. information again be sure. Ten seconds. Yes, segundo. And Larry, you're correct, it was the silver medal. My error. Breathe, breathe. That's it, breathe. Good. Good. One more time. That's it. Jerry Alai interpreting Spanish in Miguel Cotto's corner. And when we go across the ring to the corner of Octavio Carl, we'll there to speak German. Our internal is, or interpreter is Jens Holling. Be careful. Let's stay calm. If he comes, you stay calm and do nothing. You did very good. Always with your leading hand. Und 
Gambi box numbers in round one, and it was a uh, relatively cautious feeling out round for both fighters. Cotto 13 out of 49, Urkel 17, or excuse me, 7 out of 34. Cotto throwing 27 jabs out of those 49 punches, hasn't really unleashed in full effect the body arsenal yet. There's a right to the rib cage by Cotto, and Urkel tries to come back with a left hook upstairs. Another right to the rib cage by Cotto, and there's the thudding left to the rib cage. Keeps his hands high and up around his forehead, does Cotto, before dipping to throw those body punches. Body shot no, by Urko. Okay. Trying to fight a little fire with fire. I'm here. You fight. Next to each other, Cotto looks much the stronger man. It's not to say that Urkel doesn't look strong. I mean, he's a good, well-conditioned athlete, as Lennox pointed out. It's just that Miguel Cotto has a thick trunk. <laughs> Left hook upstairs. Urkel kind of shakes his head a little bit. Cotto blocking a body shot with his arms. Urkel seems determined in this round, Lennox, to make his own impression on the body and try to discourage Cotto from unleashing his body attack by throwing his own body punch. Well, what, what he does nicely, he throws a combination, he covers up well. From everything Urkel said before the fight, the appearance was he was coming for a payday. He sort of knew what was going to happen. But give him credit, he's a professional and he's performing at what looks to be his best at this time in his career. What a tremendously spirited fight against Castazu oh, no, 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 no. on a night when a lot of people thought he was going to be totally outgunned. Okay, okay. Hey. Pressed Vivian Harris to the hey. limit in two fights in Germany. And Harris was trained by Emmanuel Stewart. Oh, yeah, Cotto having trouble finding the target with those body shots as Urkel keeps his elbows pinned down deep against the ribcage. So Cotto comes upstairs with a left hook and then lowers the shot. And Urkel coming back twice over the top with his right hand. Good Lock. body punches always know how to get your hands down. And the way our Cotto's doing this, showing body punches. And if, if Urkel's covering his body, he's coming up with hooks. He's hitting wherever he's open. Wherever he sees the spot that's open, that's where he's hitting. That's, that's a... Mark of a good boxer. Cotto excites the crowd by banging away to the body with two shots. Throws two jabs upstairs. Urkel holds out his glove as if to say, hey, we're sportsmen here. Cotto simply walks away to his corner. March 5, catch the next installment of Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel. Among the stories, we sit down with new Chicago Cubs manager Lou Pinella. And starting April 15, tune into the premiere of our special four-part series, Deloya Mayweather 24-7. Unprecedented access will take you inside the lives and training camps of both fighters as they prepare for their highly anticipated mega showdown. Keep up with the jab. Remember the jab. Don't stand there in front of him waiting for it. Move it. Move it. Cotto is another left-handed man who fights from the right-handed or conventional style. He does everything left-handed. You saw when he played golf for Chichi Rodriguez, he was hitting the balls left-handed. Thus putting his stronger hand in front, and what that often means is pretty good jabber, excellent hooker. In this case, Cotto's strongest punch by far is his left hook been working on the straight right hand over the years much as Oscar De La Hoya started out with a great left hook because he's a natural southpaw had to work over the years to gradually improve his right hand good left hook by Urkel there there's the left hook to the body by Cotto and he slams it into Urkel's ribcage one more time Urkel trying to fight back throwing right hands over the top 
Okay, okay nobody throw, nobody throw, nobody throw, okay? Already after the second round, Urkel had begun blowing out of the nostrils. And that isn't always regarded as a good idea because it can prompt swelling if you're getting hit around the nose. But the red spots on Urkel's face are up around his temples and his forehead because he's been holding his hands high. Right, watch your head, watch your head. No, nobody throw, nobody throw, okay. Watch your head, watch your head, okay. And it looks like Urkel is boxing with his mouth open a little bit. I don't know if his mouth guard's a bit too big for it. Or he could be tired early. Well, he's been landing some good punches, head punches, but they don't seem to bother Koto, Koto at all. Watch your head, watch your head. Koto's standing there like he almost wants you to throw a punch at him so he can react off of it. And there was the sledgehammer left hook to the body, and Urkel is backing off. Koto has twice landed that left hook to the body in this recent sequence, and... Urkel knows now the danger of facing this body puncher up close. And there it is again. And, and I don't know that I've ever seen a knowing crowd like this cheer body punches. Hey, watch your head. Well, maybe in the days when Julio Cesar Chavez was entertaining Mexican fans with exactly the same kind of attack. Because if there's one fighter that Cotto reminds me of, Larry, it's Chavez in his prime, hey, stop, hammering stop. away Nobody at the ribcage with that left hook. Urkel's doing a wise thing. He's, he's anytime he gets inside, he's tying Cotto up because he doesn't want to get hit by those body shots. He's, they're definitely affecting him. Now Cotto fires the left hook upstairs. Urkel wobbles back a little bit. Urkel comes back with two hard punches of his own. Oktai is working as hard as he can to make clear that he's a competitor in the fight. This is a proud athlete getting beaten up. Earlier I mentioned that if Miguel Cotto can get past this fight and if Zab Judah can get past a more or less ceremonial occasion on April 13 and against an opponent yet to be named. Judah would be the next opponent for Cotto and that would take place June 9 in Madison Square Garden in New York. Of course, you're talking about Zab's hometown of New York City and he would expect a great deal of crowd support, but it's also the night before the Puerto Rican Day Parade. I believe it would be the third consecutive year in which Cotto would be fighting in New York the night before the Puerto Rican Day Parade. It's become a sort of routine occasion for him and you hear the crowd boo now as on the television monitors that they're watching in the arena they see that shot of Judah Judah's been away from the sport a whole year Lennox as the result of his suspension after the uh, riot that was prompted in the ring following his two fouls against Floyd Mayweather last April to come back and then fight a sort of tune-up opponent and go in against Cotto is not an easy assignment well I'm sure he's been in the ring in the gym and uh, I know he's been working hard, so we should see good things from him when he comes back. And here, as Larry Merchant said earlier, Oktai or Cal getting a chance to land big punches against Miguel Cotto, and Cotto just walking through them for the right to keep throwing and firing okay. away to the body. Unlike the occasion at 140 pounds where he traded punches with Ricky Torres and got himself in big trouble, Cotto's able to take these punches very well. He's gotten hit on the chin right on the button two or three times in this round and just kept coming forward. This is, this is turning out to be a more spirited fight than the first one, which was expected to be the action fight. Incidentally, you heard Harold Letterman tell you before the fight that there will be open scoring after the fourth and eighth rounds, so they'll announce the scores in the arena after the fourth and eighth rounds. Hey, come on. Stop, 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 stop. Some people like it, I guess. One of those interesting pieces of boxing politics because the governing body which sanctions this fight is not interested in open scoring. It's another governing body that wants to do it. It's the local commission here which decided they wanted to do it tonight. Scores are probably going to show that Miguel Soda has won the round, which isn't going to come as a mystery to anybody. 
Good hard left to the jaw inside by Cotto. And the body shots again. You listen to the crowd, ooh and ah, for the body shots of Cotto. And Urkel comes back with a couple of right hands to the body as if to say, hey, I can hit to the rib cage too. You know, very often body shots are ignored. Stop, stop, stop. Not only by the crowd, hey, but even listen, officials. Listen, listen. But Cotto's okay. body listen shots okay. can't be ignored by anyone. <laughs> Well, no. you, you know the funny thing about body shots? Hitting head, the head. body, if you hit the body, it comes from the old school, when you hit the body, the head dies. And even if a tall, if you're boxing a taller opponent and you hit the body, all of a sudden, that taller opponent becomes shorter. It becomes your height. Well, it was Joe Fraser who uttered that, you know, kill the body and the head will follow. Who was the toughest body puncher you ever fought, Lennox? Out. Ray Mercer? Ray Mercer did, gave me a great fight. He was throwing some great body shots, but I was coming back. I would say, you know, it would have to be Evander Holyfield, Ray Mercer. Good uppercut by Koto there, catching Urkel. Almost lifted him off the canvas, but Urkel came back with a combination. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Two. All right, nice and deep. You all right? Come on. Take a deep breath. You have to hit him more. I want you to hit him lower. Ladies and gentlemen, the score totals after four rounds. All three judges scored about 40 to 36. Four. For Miguel Did, Cotto. Didn't somebody For win the rounds? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Yes, For Miguel Cotto. Well, what a shock. <laughs> all four judges, or all three judges scored 40 to 36 so far for Miguel Cotto. Now, Harold, you get to chime in. How, How do you ju- score it? I, I think that's outstanding ju- judging by judges A, B, and C. 40 to 36 is absolutely the correct score. Miguel Cotto hammering away at Acte Urco with those shots to the body that are making me say, ouch. I, I mean, just fishy shots to the body. I don't know how Urco can stand there and trade with him, but he is. The, the kid's doing an amazing job hanging in there. 4 to nothing, 40 to 36 Cotto. And this is why open scoring is a horrifically bad idea. Whatever suspense might have existed in the arena has now been eliminated, and Uptai Urkal has no adjustment that he can make that would change things anyway, other than to get desperate and give himself more of a chance to get hurt. Right, Lennox? Right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think in this case it makes a whole lot of difference. Oh, I just still think it's a horrific idea whether it makes a difference or not. Everybody in the arena and in the ring knows what the score of the fight is. Right. To be fair, I, I like the suspense. I don't like to know. That I agree with. Round five, and, you know, a lot of the question now is how long can Oktai Urkal hold out and fight bravely and show spirit? and show his resolute courage against what is becoming a thudding beating to the ribcage by a ribcage beater, Miguel Cotto. Okay, stop. Now their heads butt against each other, and Cotto kind of grimaces as if to say that didn't feel good. Urkel sticks the jab. Cotto goes back to banging away at his ribcage. Like a a German in Lederhosen trying to climb up a mountain. left hand upstairs by Cotto. Crowd responds with oohs and ahs to that. As much as they like the head punches, they respond even more enthusiastically when Cotto digs that left hook to the liver. They know what they're watching. Urkel has to be careful here because every time he covers up, his head comes across his front foot saying that his balance is is in front of him. And that's very open for Cotto to throw an uppercut. And Cotto keeps throwing uppercuts. He's thrown both a left uppercut and a right uppercut within the past 30 seconds of the fight. What about Cotto's potential height disadvantage against bigger welterweights like Williams and Cintron and Margarito? Lennox, do you think it's going to be significant? 
Well, it can be significant if he allows it to be significant. If he's able to get in there and get to the body, then it's not significant because taller guys have a hard time in fighting, and that's where his advantage will be. Williams, Inside. Williams would have as much as a 13-inch reach advantage. Oh, there was a clash of heads there, and Cotto's open, bleeding. yes. And that's the second clash of heads in the round. You saw Cotto grimace the first time, and not happy about this one. I told you, I told you it was going to happen. Check out that mouthpiece. One. Come on, breathe deeply now. Deeply again. All right, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. And here we're going to look at the butt. They were both throwing punches at the same time. And there it is, the clash of heads right there. Now here's a way that open scoring can affect the fight. There's a fighter who has, whose head is gashed by an accidental headbutt and knows the score of the fight can uh, do a little dramatics. The fight is stopped. He's won the fight. Yet another potential bad effect of open scoring. Underlining my point again. Body shots again from Miguel Cotto. <laughs> Urkel stopped only once in his career, that in the 11th round by Vivian Harris. This has become a sort of ongoing measuring stick for Cotto. Got Bronco out of there last year, much more quickly than anybody had ever been able to do before. Got Quintana out in the fifth round after Quintana had outboxed punching prospect Joel Julio of Colombia. Now with the blood flowing from outside his left eye, Cotto goes to work on trying stop, to finish stop. off Urkel. Yep. Hey, second time. Hey, you give it. Uh, it's a yeah, good yeah. And Urkel's, Urkel's definitely sticking the head in there. Yep, and Luis Pabon is warming him. Now says he's warned him twice and is going to begin taking points for butts if it happens again. Incidentally, there's kind of a magic number in the sport. If you land 50% of your uh, power shots uh, via copy box numbers, you're going to beat your opponent up. After the last round, you saw the numbers on your screen that indicated Miguel Cotto was landing exactly 50% of his power shots. Urkel's not doing badly, landing 43% of his power shots. They just don't have as much power. If you look, look at Urkel, Urkel realizes that he's got that cut over his right eye. He's throwing punches towards that right, uh, left eye of, of Cotto. So Cotto switches southpaw to turn the eye away from him and make it harder for Urkel to hit that uh, leading eye. This is something Cotto did against Quintana, a southpaw. He turned southpaw to create better punching angles and set up the power shot. He does it again here. But Urkel's still throwing that right hand. He's aiming for that, that eye. And that's why Cotto has turned into this stance to turn the eye farther away from Urkel and make it harder for him to hit it. And incidentally, he's pretty doggone defective this way. Because, of course, as Larry Merchant pointed out, if he were to have fought in his natural style, he would have been a southpaw, fighting with his jab in this position and the power shot from the back shoulder like this. Harold, I have a question for you. Let's say... Cotto's eye, which originally came from an accidental butt, gets significantly worse by punches. Is he is he TKO'd if he can't go on? If the original cut is caused by an accidental headbutt and it's beyond the fourth round, you go to the score cut, Larry. Let me see your face. You have something left. You can finish it. You have to move more. Come on, breathe deeply. Come on, don't let him do that to you. Come on, let's work it how we're supposed to do it. Let's do it.
Good job, good job. You're doing good. Move out, move out of those right hands. You gotta love the intelligence of Miguel Cotto switching to a southpaw stance to protect that left eye in the last round. Let's see if he does it again. Starts out in a conventional stance here. Otay Urkal's trainer, perhaps a little optimistic in saying, oh, he's got not, nothing left. I think you can finish him. Not really sure about that. Cotto would seem to have plenty left, albeit blood around the left eye. Cotto throwing a little bit more upstairs now, as if he's interested in perhaps shortening the distance between here and the end of the fight. Okay, no, 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 no. We're in the seventh of the scheduled 12 rounds, and it would appear that Cotto has won all of the first six. We know that he won all of the first four on all three official judges' scorecard because they're using open scoring here. Now, Cotto's got a good job. He needs to use it a lot more. Right now, he's trying to get inside and throw some power punches. Lands a left hook to Urkel's chin. No matter, no matter how much Cotto pounds his body, Urkel okay, still stop, keeps stop. his gloves high, and he's trying to keep his elbows in, but it, he's protecting his face first. He's a well-trained fighter. There's Urko putting that head in there again. I know the referee's going to warn him. Yep. Time, time. And this is going to be the point deduction. Lennox Lewis right on top of it. Two warnings prior to this, and now a point deduction for Urko, who, of course, isn't in the fight on points anyway. If I've ever seen a meaningless point deduction, that was it. Urkel with a full swinging left hook and a wink at Lennox Lewis. Where's that head to go? Watch your head. Hey, watch your head. Watch your head. This is a pretty good referee, Pabon. He sees all the same things that you see. Watch your head. Watch your head. Okay, nobody throw. Nobody throw. Watch your head. You know, the scoring is one-sided. The outcome seems ordained. If you didn't see the fight and you read the newspapers, it would just say that Cotto dominated a game German who just wasn't up to it. But Cotto's going to go home tonight knowing he was in a fight. Absolutely. <laughs> because Urkel is one of those 365-day-a-year athletes, typical of the European-style fighter in this day and age. I mean... People can criticize European fighters for their supposed stand-up style and mechanical quality, but the fact of the matter is they're in shape, they're intelligent, they know how to fight. Well, Dry's body off. All right, breathe deeply again. Come on, keep working it. Put some water on his body. He keeps throwing his head. He doesn't say anything. Hey, he took a point away. He's tired. Did you notice? He's definitely tired. You have to go through him. Go through the middle. Take your leading hand. And this time, the German trainer's advice may well be on point because Cotto did seem to take a bit of a rest in the seventh round. Urkel, by CompuBox numbers, landing more power shots in the round, 16 out of 31 to 10 out of 27, landing more punches and throwing more punches in the round. If you were looking for a round in the fight to give to Urkel, that was it. Harold Letterman did so, but because of the point deduction, it becomes 9-9 on his card. Let's go ahead. How distracting is it to Cotto to be fighting with the blood coming from the cut above his left eye, Lennox? 
it is distracting for him because he doesn't want to get cut. Okay, it just gives him something else to worry about. And, you know, no fighter likes to get cut in there because there's always that chance that the referee's going to stop it or the cut could worsen. We're three months away from June 9. Could it affect his date in Madison Square Garden with Zab Judah? It may affect his date depending how fast he heals and how bad the cut is. It doesn't look like a, a serious rip around the eye. As you can see, Urko still throwing punches towards that left eye, wanting to open it. But it could get more serious in the next three or four rounds. Exactly. You don't expect that Koto's thinking about that, incidentally. You don't expect that he's in there thinking, oh no, I'm going to lose my June 9 date with Chuda in Madison Square Garden. But you do expect that he could be distracted by the constant butting, the constant head contact, and the trickle of blood. He definitely is distracted from it because, you know, that's what Urko came to do, to make it not an easy day for him. Well, you said in the opening on camera, Urkel needed to find a way no, to no, take no, Koto no. out of his game. Accidentally, though it happened, it seems okay, for okay, the okay, moment okay. to have happened. Not that it gives Urkel necessarily a big chance to win the fight, just that it means that maybe the fight goes a much greater distance than Koto might himself okay, have expected. No, 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 no. He's accustomed to chopping people down around the 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth Ooh. round. Urkel definitely came to fight. He's not one of these guys to lay down. Came in with the strategy. Okay, okay, no, 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 no. No, no holding. And there's no question Miguel Cotto's punches in the last two rounds have not had the same snap as in the preceding rounds where okay, almost no, 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 no. everything was thudding audibly. Seems like he's biding his, his time right now. He's waiting for that right opportunity where it can really explode on Urkel. Okay, this is the eighth of schedule 12 in between rounds. Time. Once again, Michael Buffer will read the official scores. Hey. Urka, Urka, Urka. That's going. Referee's going to let, let the doctor look at it. Possibility of stopping the fight and going to the scorecards. I mean, doctor says he can fight. Ten seconds to go in the round. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, that was a bad headbutt right at the end of the round by Urko. Which once again interrupts the flow as we get ready to show you a package of Tape looks at Miguel Cotto's body shots throughout the fight, as I mentioned, regarded by many as the superior body puncher in the sport at this moment. Left hook to the body, right to the body. It's, it's the way he sits down on this Lennox and commits to it that creates the power, right? He, and his accuracy is great. He just knows how to throw that punch right behind the elbow and get through with the punch. He throws it in a good fashion. <laughs> Step back a little bit. Huh? So he doesn't put the head in. Well, I didn't hear the scores. Did you? Koto seems anxious to begin the action again. After round seven and eight seeming to be a little bit less zesty for Koto, he comes back out with a flurry to begin the night. It's interesting what goes on between fighters sometimes. Big uppercut with the left hand by Koto. And there's that uppercut I was telling you about because Urko Docks his head right into that uppercut. Anytime he's protecting his body, he tucks down right down into that uppercut. Okay, here are the scores. Cotto leading 77-74, 78-73, and 80-71. Harold, how do you have it? 
Jim, I've got it 79 72. Seven rounds for Cotto, one round even. The one round even being the round that uh, referee Louis Pabon took a point away from Octa Yerkow, which made it an even round. I mean, Miguel Cotto just hammering away at the body, round after round after round. The only round he lost was like Lennox called it. Okay, no 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 took him out of his game with a headbutt. But other than that, it's all Miguel Cotto 79 72. I have it pointed too closer. Um, Cotto doesn't appear to be in any danger um, except to his reputation. Well, what about his reputation, Larry? I mean, could his reputation be damaged if he has to go to the distance well, against Oktay or Kyle in a fight of this nature with an accidental cut over his left eye? No, I think you give him credit. He won the fight. He fought a tough guy. He couldn't get if that's the way it turns out. But... Um, you know, he's been dominant in this fight as he was against Malinaji. Malinaji fought okay, him nobody, hard. Nobody. Uh, so, you know, but we want to see what he does against somebody who can really crack. Because he's been cracked a, okay, a few times nobody, nobody. by Urkel to no effect. Lennox, do you think Zab Judah can really crack? Zab Judah can definitely crack. Whether he, whether he can uh, do it against Koto is the question. Lloyd Mayweather would say maybe Zab can crack for the first few rounds, but not after that. Mayweather called Judah a front runner who's capable of fighting for three or four rounds, but not beyond that point. Koto may be tired because he's fighting an unusual round here, backing up to the ropes. I think he's just trying another strategy. He wants Yurkow to come at him and see if he can commit himself and make any mistakes so he can take advantage of that. Monday, April 15, tune into the premiere of our special four episode series, De La Hoya Mayweather 24 7. We'll go inside the lives of both fighters through exclusive interviews and full behind the scenes access to their training camps as they prepare what projects as the biggest fight since Lennox Lewis fought Mike Tyson in Memphis June 8, 2002. In other words, the biggest fight in four years and 11 months in our sport, De La Hoya versus Mayweather. And here we're going to see Koto take advantage of that uppercut and the fact that Urkel is sticking that head down. Great uppercut. And Urkel's either saying that was a good shot or is that all you have? Or both. <laughs> but hey, remember, Urkel went the distance with Costa Zou, who was regarded as a monster puncher at 140 pounds at that time. Urkel went to the 12th round, uh, actually fought the distance with Vivian Harris one time through, and then was TKO'd on the 11th. In both fights, he fought with a broken nose, and Harris was regarded as a pretty big puncher at 140 pounds, pretty sharp puncher at least. So it's no shame, it would appear, on record if Cotto has to go the distance to beat Oktay Urkal. Urkal's the kind of fighter who's done this against good fighters before. Still in all, he's 36. Koto's 26 in his prime, stronger man. Now this time I get to correct you. He's 37. <laughs> We're even. Koto's doing the right thing, starting off everything with a jab. Very important when, when all the action becomes a bit lax, 
that jab really starts everything off again. And Erico's not an easy target. He's moving around the ring. He's and doing what he does naturally, and that's movement. He's right, a great right. mover. And incidentally, he's been pretty active with his own hands. In fact, as of moments ago, Tyler Cow has now landed more power punches against Miguel Cotto than anyone else in the 18 Cotto fights that CompuBox has tracked. Now, part of that is the result of the fact that they fought into the 10th round, and a lot of Cotto fights have been shorter than that. I mean, Kelson Pinto was landing power shots, and Ricardo Torres was landing power shots, but those fights ended in six or seven rounds. A couple of years ago in Dortmund, Germany, when Vladimir Klitschko was fighting there, I ran into uh, Urkal in the fitness room. He wasn't even fighting at the time. He was working out. And you can see how fit this 37-year-old man is. And Miguel Cotto is totally frustrated with Otay Urkal because of the number of times that their heads have come together. And Cotto just expressed it by lifting Urkal up in what almost became a WWF move. All right, right there. Come on, watch out for the Z-Bots, man. Don't move your head. Don't move your head. Don't do that same thing again. Come on, man. Don't do that again. You have to be careful with your defense. Keep it closed. It's dangerous if you open up. It can get you if you open it up. And, and here's that little thing at the end. You know, let me tell you, for Cotto to do this shows great strength. It's not easy, easy to do a thing like this, to lift your opponent up. Does it show a lack of composure, though? Not really. You know, the guy's leaning on top of him. He's just standing straight up and picking him up with him. I don't know. It doesn't look like any great act of strength to me. Larry, you were a football player at the University <laughs> of Oklahoma. I mean, you've probably done that to 230-pound fullbacks yeah, back in your day, right? Okay, no lies, no lies, no lies, okay? Crowd wants Cotto to get his knockout. So they roar with approval every time he lands something. He fires that left hook to the body to punish Urkow with it one more time, but Urkow just isn't going to go from the body punches tonight. One point. Head. Another headbutt penalty against Urkow. I don't know about that one. They're throwing the towel in from the corner. They want Urkow's the corner is going to throw in the towel. The trainer says enough, and Cotto gets his knockout. Why? I don't. I don't. Yeah, get I it. didn't understand that one bit. He wasn't losing the fight. He was doing well. I. I that I, was weird. I, I think the trainer is saying that the referee is being unfair in constantly penalizing Urkal, and they don't want to be a part of it anymore. Well, that. And they also knew the scores because of the open scoring, which eliminated any suspense about whether Urkal had a know, chance I, to win the fight. And, and, but I have to remark that I didn't see any serious headbutts. Not in that last, not, not when the referee la, uh, last warned him. I didn't notice any headbutts whatsoever. Basically, Urkow just, you know, grabbed him and tied him up. Let and me no get on my soapbox. They threw in the towel because of open scoring. That was the reason <laughs> that the fight was stopped when it was. The ending was such an anticlimax to me. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's oh, what a brilliant idea. It's disappointing <laughs> for the fans because they want to see at least the end of the fight. They wanted to see Cotto, you know, try and get that knockout if it, if it was there, but at least allow your boxer to end the fight. Don't stop it. It's always so disappointing for a boxer. Kyle trainer, Uli Wegner, probably partially in frustration with the referee and knowing that his fighter has no chance to win the fight, and feeling as though at 37 there might not be much reason for a cow to take another four and a half minutes of body shot punishment, throws in the towel. 
and the crowd gets an extremely anticlimactic finish rather than the definitive stoppage they had been hoping for. Now here's the deduction of the point, which only underlines the fact that Urkal is going to lose by big numbers. Then there's Uli Wegner saying, come on, let's go back to Berlin. Let's get on the plane right now. I know Urko's not happy about that. He would have wanted that fight to end properly. Of course, he wanted to go the distance. And if it weren't for open scoring, he probably would have. You know, this kind of stoppage affects your record. You don't want that kind of stoppage on your record. Let's go to Michael Buffer for what should have been the first official reading of the scores all evening. Ladies and gentlemen, at the urging of his corner, the challenger, unable to continue, referee Luis Pabon calls a halt to the contest. The official time, one minute, one second, round number 11. The winner, still undefeated, El Victor de Aguas, Puerto Rico, Miguel Coro. 29th win, 24th knockout in Cotto's career. No asterisk will appear in the record book to say that the knockout was the product of a towel thrown in because of open scoring. But that's the way this reporter sees it, as well as perhaps a few others. Harold, I have to assume that you had Cotto uh, prohibitively ahead in the fight. Oh, yeah, Jim. 98-91, he was ahead by at least seven points at the time that they stopped the fight. There was no question. And with the corner knowing the score, I mean, if they, what the heck, we can't win this fight, they stopped it. I mean, open scoring had a lot to do with them stopping the fight. You're 100% correct, Jim. 44% connect percentage overall for Cotto to 29% for Urkal. Look at that. Urkal threw three more punches in the fight. Brave, spirited effort for Ty Urkal in a fight which clearly he was not going to be able to win from the very beginning, but he came all the way from Berlin to San Juan to compete and to show his pride as a competitor and probably deserved a chance as the result of that to finish the fight. His corner made a decision not to let him do so. Power punches, Cotto landing 41 more, throwing 33 more, and once again, when you land more than 50% of your power punches in the fight, you are going to beat your opponent up if you hit with any pop whatsoever, and Miguel Cotto most certainly does. Larry Merchant stands by with Miguel Cotto, who increasingly speaks English in his interviews, though he may occasionally need some assistance from interpreter Jerry Olaya. Miguel's working on this and getting better all the time. Let's go to Larry. Thank you very much, Jim. Congratulations, Miguel. Were you puzzled by what happened at the end of the fight? Well, I think uh, the, his corner going to pass uh, the same at me. And I'm a little bit confused with the, with the, with the head of my opponent. And he, try, uh, he uh, think he, he's better stop the fight. Did you think he was butting you deliberately? No sé, no sé si lo hizo. Uh, I don't know if it was uh, 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 proposal or, or not, but but he, he hit me with the head. W was the blood and the cut bothering you? A little bit. In the in the in a few uh, moments of the of, of any round, the the blood uh, bothered me a little bit. Are you concerned that it might impair you to fight on in June? Yeah, I'm I'm going to taking care of my cut now. I'm going uh, from here to the hospital to, to see the, the cut, and I'm going to prepare for you. Was he a little bit better, more spirited than you expected, given all the punishment you were giving him to the body? Well, the, the blood uh, uh, helped him to, to survive, you know? I, I think uh, when the blood appeared in, in the fight, I'm, I'm, put, uh, I'm going uh, low in the fight. So you think that that inspired him to think he had a chance to win the fight? No, I, I think I'm always going in front of the fight. But, excuse me, but uh, the blood bothered me I, a lot in the fight. You heard the scoring, the giving out, the public scoring. Were you aware that you were so far ahead? I, I never hear the score. I always stay, uh, uh, pay attention of my corner, and I, know, I don't know the, the, how the score it was. Let's look ahead just a little bit. We know you have a fight, prospectively, with Zab Judah in June. Whenever I've asked you in the past, 
who do you want to fight? You always said, well, let top rank figure that out. You tell me who you want to fight. All the big names, all the big names, 147 pounds. I'm going to, I'm, I want to fight with them. How much better on a scale of one to 10 are you better as a welterweight than as a junior welterweight? Junior uh, welterweight, I yes. feel better, I feel more stronger. I feel uh, with more stamina. I feel better in 147 pounds. Congratulations again, Thank you, Miguel. All right, we're going to speak to Urkal's trainer. Tell us exactly why you wanted to end the fight when you did. First, congratulations Er hat zu diesem Zeitpunkt, wo ich abgebrochen habe, geführt. Wir hatten auch bei den Ringrichtern keine Chance. Äh, Kotto konnte viel auf den Nieren hauen, unerlaubte Schläge machen. Und er wurde das zweite Mal verwarnt. Wir hatten keine Siegechance mehr. Und warum soll ich den Jungen noch zwei Runden gehen lassen, äh, wenn er sowieso keine Siegechance mehr hat? The other one was leading through all the rounds and he was doing uh, uh, punches that are not allowed. And uh, the ring, uh, the judge let, let it slide, and this is why I threw it Are down. you referring specifically to body punches that you thought were too far in the back? Meinen Sie Körpertreffer, die zu weit im hinten? Ja, die waren genau. Sie haben recht. Die so weit hinten. Der Junge ist vollkommen rot und blau hinten. Und ich habe die Gesundheit jetzt vorgesehen. You're correct. He, uh, he was totally uh, red and blue in the back, and this is exactly what I'm talking about. Were you aware of the open scoring, and that that did that influence you in stopping the fight? Was Ihnen bewusst, dass Sie die Punkte bekannt gegeben waren in der Mitte des Kampfes, und hat das Ihre Entscheidung beeinflusst? Sicherlich. Ich habe gesehen, man muss auch sagen, Kotte ist ein klasse Mann. Ich muss sagen, Okta Oka hat hier einen Bombenkampf gemacht. Das hat man in der Reaktion in der Publikum gesehen. Glückwunsch, Kotto ist ein Weltklasse Mann, da gibt es nichts dran zu teufeln, aber ich muss mit den Ringrichtern entscheiden, bin ich einfach schlimm. I definitely uh, was influenced by the open scoring, but I also have to say that uh, Kotto did a very good fight, he's a world class fighter and uh, my fighter didn't have a chance with, uh, with this judge in the ring. Field Duncan. Jim? All right, thank you very much, Larry. And uh, so you heard the story from Uli Wegner, who felt as though Cotto was getting away with punches uh, too far onto the back of Uktai Urkal. But, of course, open scoring, as we mentioned before, a factor in ultimately making that decision. Lennox, let's look ahead to the potential fight on June 9 between Miguel Cotto and Zab Judah off what we saw here. Judah is slightly taller, probably a couple of inches taller. He'll have a five-inch reach advantage in the fight. If anything, he probably has faster hands than Miguel Cotto. Well, Will that be Cotto's toughest test so far in his career? I think it'll be a big test for him. Is you know, uh, Zab Judah is a good boxer. So he, if if Zab decides to go out there and box and has a has a plan, he should do quite well. But it's going to be a rough fight for him, and it's going to be a good fight for everybody, yep. all the fans. Zab Judah lost a fight unexpectedly to a relatively slow, hard body puncher, Carlos Baldemir. Cotto's a much quicker hard body puncher than Carlos Baldemir. Maybe it's not all that good a matchup for Judah either, right? Well, he's been in against a body puncher, so let's hope he's learned something from that and been able to do something about that. You know, different fighters bring different different fights, and, uh, you know, he's been in against a guy that's a great, strong guy in Baldemir. Now he's going in with Coda, so he's he, maybe he's learned something from this fight, how to frustrate him. We shall see if it takes place on June 9. It requires that uh, Judo win a preparatory fight on April 13. He's been away from the sport for a year since his April 8 debacle against Floyd Mayweather last year. Larry Merchant, it was supposed to be a showcase for Miguel Cotto's uh, body-punching power and his new ability to dominate in the welterweight division. And uh, to a certain degree, it became a showcase for, number one, the invalidity of open scoring, as I see it. Number two, what a conditioned and spirited athlete Uktai Urkal was as an opponent. And still, Cotto got through it in the way that he's supposed to do. What do you think? I think that they've got another one. By they, I mean Puerto Rico has another champion. And maybe with the uh, performance of Edison Miranda as well, who came here to learn how to fight, they will still have another champion they can claim. Woke up this morning, two newspapers, just to show you that this is still a mainstream sport someplace. One of them, the English-speaking newspaper, a full half-page 
on the way in. Right there. The other newspaper, the Spanish newspaper, a full section on the fight. And then I took a walk out in the park, and there was a statue to Sixto Escobar, the first world champion that Puerto Rico produced 70 years ago. When he came home from having won that title on a boat, thousands of people greeted him. One of them was Jack Dempsey. This is a fight culture. Later on, we saw many, many more champions come out of that Puerto Rican culture uh, that were, were outstanding world champions. And looking at this now and seeing how important prize fighting is here, you know that this is something deeply bred into the culture, that this is a place that, given the number of Puerto Ricans there are, something about 8 million both on the island and in the states primarily, that pound for pound, this is the best place in the world for boxing. Jim? Indeed. Carlos Ortiz, Jose Torres, Wilfredo Benitez, Felix Trinidad, Miguel Cotto. And perhaps, as Larry mentioned, after tonight, the Colombian import, Edison Miranda. Cotto gets the victory he was looking for. He's 29-0 and with 24 knockouts. We'll continue to chart and see what happens in his new career as a welterweight star. Thanks for being with us on this edition of HBO's World Championship Boxing. We want to remind you that this Monday, it's Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel. With March Madness upon us, we'll check in on the Wisconsin Badgers men's basketball team, Alanda Tucker and company. And next Saturday, live at 4.45 p.m. Eastern time from Mannheim, Germany. Vladimir Klitschko defends his portion of the heavyweight title against veteran Ray Austin. If you miss it, we'll re-air Klitschko Austin in its entirety that same night at 10 p.m. Next on HBO, it's the premiere of Cat House Season 2. On the East Coast and on the West Coast, the premiere of Poseidon. For our entire HBO crew, I'm Jim Lampley saying so long from San Juan, Puerto Rico. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.